subscribe to the YouTube channel. Folks, I think with that, it's time that we get right into it. And today I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic communities. I'm your host, Lot Kumina from IBM Quantum. And today I have the pleasure of hosting Shlomi Kotler from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Hello, Shlomi, how are you today? Hi, Zlatko. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm excited that you accepted our invitation. Uh, tell us, where are you tuning in from? Uh, I'm, I'm tuning in from my uh, office in, in Jerusalem. It's a, it's a Friday afternoon here. Wonderful. Uh, I think we have had the time zones where, you know, we're more than 12 hours apart and it's a different day, uh, but hopefully this hour is convenient enough. Now, before we begin with your slides, allow me to give a bit of background. Uh, Shlomi received his undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics from the Hebrew University, Jerusalem, Israel in 1999, his master's in theoretical mathematics at the Hebrew University in 2005, his PhD in experimental physics with trapped ions at the Weizmann Institute of Science in 2013. And then he went on to a uh, postdoc uh, in uh, applied physics uh, working with trapped ions, superconducting devices, and mechanical devices. I think you didn't leave anything out at NIST. Uh, he finished that up in 2020. Uh, since then, he's joined the Hebrew University of Jerusalem as an assistant professor, uh, and we are thrilled to have you here today. Thanks, uh, Zlatko and, and Paul and the IBM Kiske team for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so I'll jump right in. Uh, my name is Shlomi, and uh, today we'll be talking about entanglement of macroscopic objects. The first slide is uh, basically a one-minute uh, summary of the entire talk. The objects at hand are uh, two drum-like uh, uh, objects here on the left drum and here the right drum. And they're fairly macroscopic in the sense that they're much bigger than an atom, or if you wish, their diameter is comparable to that of a, a human hair. So in that sense, they're macroscopic. Entanglement here means correlations. And to be more specific, this motion of this left drum can be characterized by position and momentum. Same for the right drum. It can be characterized by position and, and momentum. And Entanglement will manifest as correlations. The position of the left drum and the position of the right drum will be highly correlated. The momentum of the left drum and the momentum of the right drum will be highly anti-correlated. And when you want to show that correlation is actually entanglement, uh, what you have to do is break some sort of a bound. And this is what you see in the upper left corner. Here the bound is one half. Anything above a half means that it's a classical correlation, it's a separable state, and anything below a half means that it is an entangled state. As, as you can see, there's experimental evidence uh, that the, this system is entangled, and this result was, was published fairly recently in, in May. Um, I'm, as, as Latko said, I'm starting a new lab at the Hebrew University, but this work was done for the most part when I was a postdoc in the Advanced Microwave Photonics Group at NIST Boulder. Um, uh, and in our group, we do uh, various uh, things related to superconducting devices, but we have a subgroup led by John Tufel uh, that does mechanical elements in the quantum regime. Back in those days, it was Gabe Peterson and myself uh, that were members of this team, and now the current postdoc is Bradley Hauer. This experiment was also uh, uh, supported by the Computing and Communication Theory Group, uh, led by Emmanuel Neal and, and, and Scott uh, Glancy, as you will see. By the way, I'd like to advertise next week Kiss Kiss Talk, which will be given by John Tufel on something completely different. Um, so let me start off this talk off by talking about uh, a little bit of the history of mechanics and more precisely quantum mechanics. And if you go more than a century uh, ago, uh, experimentalists were really concerned with atoms and more specifically, they were concerned about the spectrum of this, these atoms. And they tried to explain their experimental evidence. 
And the way to understand it was the way to understand the motion of an electron inside the atom as quantized motion, being one of the pillars of, of, of quantum mechanics. And knowing those quantized energy levels, knowing what an atomic transition is, uh, turned out to be a very useful thing to measure for two very different reasons. One reason why you would really want to know the energy separation uh, of an atom, the energy uh, difference, is if you want to probe into physics, because that energy difference contains quantum electrodynamics and corrections to quantum electrodynamics and lamp shifts. And so it's a piece of the universe that the, the better you know it, the more physics can you probe. It can only be, it can also be used as a useful device that uh, uh, energy separation inside the atom can be used to build an atomic clock. The more precise you know the atomic transition, the better clock can you build. And so uh, the name of the game was find the atomic transition. And how did they do that? Well, they used an atomic source and that atomic, those atoms had some transition and they they shine some light, light or, or radiation on these atoms. And the, during the interaction between the light and the atoms, they could do spectroscopy. And the interaction time, the passage time through that beam uh, dictated uh, uh, the resolution. Now, if you wanna have a better resolution, you might as well build a, a bigger resource, a, big, a bigger source. And that turns out to be uh, experimentally challenging. And so a breakthrough came from Ramsey that said, let's take two of these small oscillators that we know how to build well. And now my resolution is going to be the passage time between those two oscillators. And uh, here's Ramsey next to his apparatus. And that gave a huge boost to the field of spectroscopy, but you can also see the limit. How far can you build a device where the atoms are shooting at, at huge velocities from one end of the lab to the, the other end? And so motion, it turns out to be a nuisance. And if it's a nuisance, let's get rid of it. Enter uh, Paul and Demot, which uh, came up with the techniques of trapping uh, atoms. In fact, trapping a single atomic ion, not letting it move. And by uh, trapping, I have an infinite interrogation time in principle. And not only that, a postdoc of Demolt uh, in 1978 proposed and eventually implemented cooling. Uh, and so now our, 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 the motion degrees of freedom are highly controlled. They're trapped and cooled. Let me show you the uh, impact of trapping and cooling. Suppose I have an atom and it has a transition of 10 to the 15 hertz. Because of uh, room temperature Doppler shifts, I will have broadening at the gigahertz level, which is fine. That gives me a quality factor of about a million. And it, and, you know, it looks like this, like a, a gigahertz resonance. Now take this atom that's uh, free and now put it in a, in a harmonic trap. And not only that, cool it, cool it close to the ground state. And now the spectrum looks very, very different. It's highly, highly narrow. And let me show you data that looks like that. Here's an atomic transition of strontium. And here are the two motional sidewinds, uh, X motion and Z motion of, of that uh, uh, atom. And if you zoom in on the center, you can, you can see that it's basically a 50 or a 60 hertz resonance. And now you're, quali you're talking about quality factors of 10 to the 13 which is not even close to be the world record. There's subhertz line widths uh, measured for, for atoms. And so uh, uh, to do good spectroscopy, you can think of motion as a nuisance, as a bug. And Daimelt and Wineland solved it by making very fine control of the motion and very fine uh, uh, control of the internal degrees of freedom. Now, in a separate corner of the academic world, these people were not thinking about motion at all. They were thinking about qubits, these imaginary objects that you can manipulate and, and weave into a quantum uh, computer. And apparently, I mean, there's, there's no connection between those two communities. 
enter uh, Peter Zoller and Ignacio Sirac, which uh, which realized that with the high uh, uh, controllability that was developed for spectroscopy, you can actually use motion as a feature to do quantum information. And they published those ideas in, in 1995 in May. And by December, the it was an uh, experimental result by the Wineland group implementing this technique. It is so elegant and relevant that I, I will introduce it, hopefully be able to introduce it in about a minute, at least the gist of it. So how do I use spectroscopy to do entangling? Well, if this is my atom and it has a ground and an excited state, and now I'm going to place it in a trap. And when I place it in a trap, I have motional sidebands. If I apply a carrier, then there's no motion is not involved. But I can do a blue sideband, basically going from ground and no motion to an excited and one quanta of, of motion. Or I can do a red sideband where I can exchange motion and internal degree of freedom. So going from ground to excited at the expense of one motional degree of uh, motional quanta. Now, what can you do with a blue and a red sideband? Well, if you take a blue sideband and stop it midway, you're going to create a bell pair and a very interesting one. It will be a, an entangling pair between internal degrees of freedom and external degree of freedom. Sorry, one second. It's, just, it's, it's Friday afternoon here. Uh, so, and now, um, sorry, so now what you see is, is this bell pair of internal degrees of freedom and motion. Uh, now, what, what do you get when you do a full red swap? Well, if you start with a superposition of the internal degrees of freedom, they, they can turn into uh, a superposition of the motional degrees of freedom back and forth. These are the two things you would need to do entangling. And so let's do it. You take two ions, you put them in one trap so they share the uh, external degree of freedom of motion, and that is elegantly described by ground, ground, and zero phonons. And now apply a blue sideband on the left ion. And when you do that, uh, uh, you, can, you can generate this bell pair between the left ion and the motion. Now do a red sideband on the right ion. Swap motion and internal degrees of freedom. And lo and behold, you've just generated a bell pair between the ions, and motion can be tensored out of the equation. And so that was the 1995 breakthrough, both theoretical and experimental. And motion is the mediator between the two ions. Now, you don't have to think about uh, mechanics of just a single trapped ion. Uh, in fact, if I want to go to the uh, other extreme of sizes, let me think about LIGO. Over the course of the decades where people were developing spectroscopy, the people who wanted to measure gravitational waves was, were deeply concerned about how would you measure the position or how would you sense the position of a test mass that experiences a gravitational wave. And as they were thinking about that problem, they realized that ultimately quantum mechanics will limit your ability to, to measure and that they should have uh, mitigation techniques for zero point fluctuations. The experiment that we'll talk today is, uh, if, you, if you wish, is on a log scale midway between a single ion and LIGO. And it kind of is a, a wedding, if you wish, of, of both worlds. It's a device where you're trying to entangle two entities using a harmonic oscillator as a mediator on the one hand. But the way you want to look at that object, the way you want to measure it, uses the same kind of yoga and care and, and uh, precision that you would, you would need for gravitational wave detection. Our system is, is not uh, uh, alone. There are many uh, kind of uh, mechanical systems uh, that are similar of various sizes. Uh, and this is a community that cares about mechanical objects, engineered mechanical objects uh, in the quantum regime. And I think with that, I will introduce the hero of today's talk, which is our device. It's a hybrid, it's a hybrid system that has uh, microwave and mechanics in it. 
microwave you can see immediately in this picture these these are nothing more than microwave launches onto a chip a sapphire chip that we all know and love and if i zoom in here on the center you get to see uh, a launch an inductive coupler that couples to four devices and if i look at one of these four devices you get to see the two drums at the bottom here and microwave circuitry that we will talk about uh, uh, now and then uh, entangling i want to stress is not enough now, we'll talk about entangling but it's it's not the only thing if you have these two harmonic oscillators and even magically you correlate their position and momentum with some entangled state, you need a way to see it. And to see it means you probably illuminating with some source of radiation and you're looking at reflections. And looking at reflections can be tricky. And we asked an artist to try and convey that idea and this is what we came up with. You may have these two drums perfectly entangled but in the end of the day, you're only looking at shadows. You're looking at reflections or shadows of your object. And those easily uh, can be not entangled. And we worried very much ab about our shadows. Uh, we thought that this artistic idea is very clever, but it turns out that uh, Ulf Leonard already used it in his book and called it uh, quantum shadows, which I think eloquently uh, describes this problem. Um, trying to be a little bit more um, precise about it, it's the story of efficiency. So suppose I have a quantum device and I want to use it as a quantum resource. It's not fully available to me. What's happening is that something is going to come in the way and inject noise. And I'm going to quantify it with some number eta. If eta is zero, I am just measuring noise. And if eta is one, uh, the full uh, resources available to me. In reality, it's somewhere between zero and one. Now, if my whole goal in life is to say, what was the state characterization posthumously, then that's fine. Then uh, I can use, if it, you know, characterize my efficiency, have a stable numeric procedure, and based on the tiny amount of signal that I have, I can backtrack and say how much of an entangled resource I used to have. So I'm seeing a tiny shadow and I'm deducing what, what, what is the giant that's causing, that, that's creating this shadow. Um, but what if I actually want to use that resource? Then that, that technique will not work. Uh, for example, if you want to do quantum teleportation or entanglement swapping, you need very high efficiencies. You cannot do this inversion uh, technique. Um, so when we set up to do this project, we wanted to do a deterministic entanglement of a macroscopic object, and we wanted to see it. We wanted to see it in the shadows, efficiently measure the entangled state. People have done, uh, demonstrated different pieces of this puzzle, both with trapped ions and with macroscopic objects. Uh, we wanted to design an experiment that sits right at the center of this uh, uh, Venn diagram, as you will see. So now I want to describe our mechanical oscillators, the drums. So a drum is nothing more than a mechanical membrane that goes up and down, you can imagine, has a frequencies in the range of 10 megahertz, determined by the diameter of the drum. It's very simple. Uh, it's a sapphire substrate, and those are aluminum uh, membranes that go up and down. What's very special about them for me, it's their zero point motion. It's a femtometer, or if you wish, it's on the order of a diameter of a proton. And this femtometer zero point motion, we will care deeply because we need to measure better than that. We need to know the position uh, of this mechanical object better than its zero point motion, meaning better than uh, uh, a diameter of a proton. Um, so what kind of a qubit is a drum? Well, let's start by describing a transmon, the transmon that we all know and love. And how do we describe transmons? Well, we say you start with a harmonic oscillator and you make it slightly anharmonic. And when you make it slightly anharmonic, you get to, get to see anharmonicity at the single photon level. Or if you wish, you can isolate the ground and excited state from the second excited state, from the F level. And you can efficiently describe this system by those few level systems. Now, 
how would you describe a drum uh, instead of a harmonic oscillator? Well, first and foremost, we do not allow small omegas. Only big omegas are allowed in my field. I don't know why. Uh, and the second thing is you can disregard the anharmonic term. It is very harmonic. In fact, our drums are harmonic all the way to a million phonons and even beyond that. In this case, you know, um, going, uh, you know, uh, making a bookkeeping of the amplitudes is not a good way. What you should do is you should use continuous variables. You should describe this system using the position and momentum quadratures and their moments, as you'll see in this talk, because we will populate a good amount of them. Uh, how do we interface our mechanical objects? We use electromechanics. Basically, we're coupling mechanics to the electromagnetic field and measure and manip manipulate using microwave photons. The cartoon picture that we should have in mind is that if an object moves, the electromagnetic field knows. Uh, that's how you get caught for speeding. Uh, a police radar shines a microwave, if you wish, at a car and looking at the Doppler side bends, they know your speed and where you were at the time uh, that you were driving. This is essentially what's happening here. So. I have a top plate, a mechanically compliant plate, and I'm trying to measure its position. How do I do that? Well, I'm gonna put a fixed plate underneath and now I have a capacitor. And this capacitor is going to be, have capacitance that depends on the position. And so now my goal is to measure capacitance. But obviously nobody measures capacitance. What we do is we usually add a, an inductor. And by adding an inductor, I have an LC resonance. And LC resonance is, is something we know how to measure well. Uh, um, and we set those resonances to be in the four to 12 gigahertz regime because it's a convenience regime to do experiments and couple it to the outside world. Very, very similar to our beloved circuit QED technique. You look at a resonator and that tells you about the state of an object you care about. Uh, now, if I do spectroscopy to this system, it's going to be a very boring thing. It's going to be an LC resonance, unless I apply a pump. When I apply a pump, lo and behold, I'm going to see a red and a blue sideband, a mechanical frequency away. The fact that the red sideband is has a higher frequency than, than the center is not because I'm colorblind. It's because we're mechanical-centric in our, in our way of thinking. What's happening in this red sideband is that I'm applying a microwave tone and I'm getting a higher frequency of a microwave tone. Where did this energy come from? It came from the mechanics. We just sucked one phonon out of the system. And this is nothing more than a beam splitter interaction between a microwave circuit and a mechanical uh, device. What's happening in the other sideband? Well, I just lost energy. Where did this energy go to? It went to the mechanics. I just pumped energy into my mechanical modes and into the lower sideband. This is a two-mode squeezing interaction. And we, we named them a blue sideband and a red sideband, very similar to trapped ions. We get to choose which one is dominant by placing the pump in different areas. So if I place the pump over here, the dominant mechanism is a blue sideband. And if I place a pump over there, the dominant mechanism is a red sideband. Now, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, cavity optomechanics. This is basically the same physics. The main difference is that cavity optomechanics is w much bigger than the wavelength, and our device is much smaller than the wavelength, and that could give you some advantages, which, which we are using in this experiment. And now, um, uh, now that you look at our device, you understand why we have those traces. Those, this is a spiral inductor forming a, uh, an LC resonance, which enables me to interface my mechanical mode. So what can you do with those gizmos? As it turns out, you can do a lot. Uh, um, about a decade ago, these were one of the first devices where people demonstrated sideband cooling to the ground state of an engineered device. As, as well as uh, the ability to generate squeeze states of mechanics. You can use those devices to demonstrate uh, 
uh, quantum limited sensing, knowing your position, the position of that drum at the quantum limit. Um, uh, you can use non-classical light in order to um, to probe the system and uh, uh, and and actually do better cooling that you would have done with uh, coherent states. And last but not least, those can be elements for uh, quantum networking, meaning that uh, you can take a mechanical device and bridge the gap between two microwave circuits using using those techniques and in order for this to work you have to place it in a dilution refrigerator so you take a, a piece of, 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 of a device you put it you know in a microwave box the same that you would do for a transmon and those go into a dilution refrigerator which gives us a very cold environment this 10 millikelvin environment now we're used to it in, with superconducting qubits, we're used to the fact that the microwave is essentially at the ground state. The mechanics is not, it has tens of quanta, but we know how to sideband cool. And so we do that as an active reset. Our coherence times are T1 at the 10 millisecond level and decoherence at hundreds of microseconds. So even though the experiment might look like it's very short, sorry, very long compared to superconducting devices, there's time there's enough coherence time to perform the experiment. Um, now, looking at this mess of microwave measurements that we all uh, are used to, it's basically having the isolators and the amplifiers and the additional amplifiers between us and the device. And we know that that gets encapsulated in this eta, the efficiency uh, parameter. And if you're not making an effort, it's about 1%. Uh, we know how to mitigate it in the superconducting community because, because we can, for example, add a JPA or add a preamplifier. And here's our uh, NIST version of a JPA, which can go very high in terms of efficiency. What's the idea behind those, uh, those preamplifiers? Well, it's not a new idea. It's known in the audio industry. If you have a, a turntable and you want to connected to a speaker, well, you, you don't do what you just see here in this picture. You don't connect it to an amplifier and then it goes to a speaker because it will be noisy. What you do is you buy a, a fancy preamplifier, connect the turntable to the preamplifier and amplify it before noise has a chance to creep in. And only then do you go to the big, large amplifier. In fact, uh, you should, what you should do is have the amplifier as close as possible to your turntable if you want to have good audio uh, uh, performance. In our case, we did not need a JPA or any preamplifier. The device was, is its own preamplifier. And it's amplifying at the plane of reference that we care about. So if this is my device, if I apply a blue sideband, then what's coming reflected off of the device is a signal that's exponentially growing. And that signal is proportional to the position and momentum of the mechanics. That is by definition a preamplifier. This method was pioneered in, in, at Jilla in Boulder, Colorado and for single drum devices. And in this talk, we, we generalized it and implemented it for two drum devices. Now let's look at uh, 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 data. Um, so here's the readout data. Just making sure, uh, Zlatko, I can't see you. I'm hopefully we're still everything's still going we're all on. We're good. Yeah, no, this oh, is beautiful. All Thank you. All right. So um, let me just show some raw data uh, 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 coming out of the device, and this is how it looks like. You see many, many, many different traces. And you're seeing the I and Q channel of a reflected microwave tone reflecting off of the device. Now, each one of those traces gives me uh, an information about the position and momentum of a drum. And so if these are the traces, they get, each trace gives me a single point here where the X axis is literally X position and the Y axis is momentum, it's P. But as you can see on the right-hand corner, I have many traces. And many traces 
translates into many points. What you're seeing here is a projected histogram of the momentum, and here it's proje projected histogram of the position, and this is the scatter, the X and P scatter. Now, this is not enough statistics to make any sense of it, so if you repeat this experiment many times, this is what you see. And what is that? That is the state of a single drum. And the variances that you're looking at is literally the temperature. If you wish, that's the definition of the temperature of this drum. And to show you that, I can cool the drum to the ground state. And when you do that, well, the variance gets smaller. Uh, we can use this technique to do a fun experiment that actually uh, connects us from the position and momentum uh, units to square root of quanta units uh, normalized by the square root of quanta. So here's how the experiment goes. Uh, if I take a, a glass of ice water and put it on the kitchen counter and wait, they'll thermalize. They'll go from the ice, icy temperature to 300 Kelvin to room temperature. I can do the same experiment with, uh, with my uh, drum. So here's a, a sideband cooled, almost ground state cooled mechanical device. And now I'm going to try and play a, a video. Hopefully, it's not going it works. And so I'm just uh, yeah. waiting and measuring, waiting and measuring. And as I wait, the variance becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's thermalizing to the, the environment. Um, you can summarize uh, this movie in the following graph. The theory to this graph gives you a sense of the T1 or the time scale. Uh, of this device and the order of eight milliseconds in this specific measurement. The top is about 31 quanta of equilibration and the bottom is the total variance measured of 1.4 quanta. Now, if the drum was perfectly still, was perfectly in the ground state, we would measure one because of the zero point motion and the fact that we're doing position, simultaneous position and momentum measurements. We're measuring not one, but 1.4, which means that we're very close to the ground state of motion of this device. And now, uh, now that we've looked at single devices, let's talk about entanglement. Now, all of these previous experiments uh, were basically focused on, on single drum. Shall How I would we do... a quick question here yeah. to interrupt you? You said the lifetime of the mechanical mode here was order of eight milliseconds? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? That seems like uh, a rather, well, I guess also it's because the frequency is very low and maybe that's more expected for- The quality, know, the quality factor, factor, if you is... wish, is around a million. Okay. The frequency is low and, and your lifetime is, is you know, long. Sure. And- um, uh, how... People know how to make devices, uh, other mechanical devices that have a quality factor that goes way beyond a million, all, all the way to a billion and even past a billion. Uh, for, for these sort of nanomechanical devices? For various nanomechanical devices, not us. We yeah. uh, we are satisfied, well, I'm, I don't want to say we are satisfied with our million, but we got a lot of mileage with one million quality factor. And uh, to invest in going beyond a million, you know, uh, we probably will do that, but we're still getting good mileage from this fairly moderate quality factor. Yeah, it gives you a nice long lifetime. Um, do you understand where the limiting mechanisms come in? Well, the clamping, if you look at this, let's look at this uh, picture. Do you see this uh, skirt, aluminum skirt that connects hard, uh, connects the, the drum uh, to the sapphire substrate? Mm -hmm. This is where you would radiate uh, phonons and get phonons from the environment. And so the technique to mitigate this is to make a phononic band gap, meaning you don't anchor directly to your, to your uh, uh, substrate. You make a phononic pattern around the rim that isolates the center uh, mode from that rim. And people have done that in various uh, uh, platforms and have shown about a thousand improvement in quality factor. I see. Uh, I guess not yet in this platform. Uh, no, not yet. And if I remember right, the, the holes that we see, those are for draining some some of the FAP material through in the process, right? Exactly. Those are for FAP purposes only. 
Perfect. And we have a quick question from uh, Elham from the audience. Could you tell us about the uncertainty in the measurements of XMP? Uh, I think she means the experimental uncertainty. Um, well, I mean, I, in many ways, that is the topic of this talk is how well can I measure X and, and P? But the way we are thinking about it is in terms of added noise. So I'm trying to measure an object that at best has zero point fluctuations. And we, we normalize our units to quantify zero point fluctuations as one half. Because we're measuring both position and momentum in this experiment, you don't have to, but we, we wanted to measure position and momentum. You're not gonna measure one half of, of fluctuations, you're gonna measure one. You're gonna double your fluctuations. Now, that is the quantum limit. And the question is, can you reach it? Can you be very close to it? And for this experiment to succeed, we had to be close to that quantum limit. So given the fact that we are measuring position and momentum, we wanted and needed to be close to this one quanta uh, fluctuation limit. Thank you very much. Uh, should I continue, Zlatko? Yes, yeah, I have a couple more questions. Oh, oh, save those oh, for well, the end. <laughs> well, no, no, we, we, I can answer more questions. Okay. Um, and maybe you will motivate more of this. But again, maybe on the device side, um, you mentioned you know sapphire and aluminum a few times. Why sapphire, right? Why not silicon and why aluminum? Oh, um, well, sapphire is you know sapphire is a very good substrate when it comes to uh, quantum information. It's it's uh, it has a very low loss tangent, mm -hmm. uh, and you can get it with high you know with high quality. Um, and as for superconducting aluminum, that is our bread and butter and, and the object that we know how to manipulate very well in the clean room. And so we used it. It doesn't have to be uh, aluminum. Um, no, but it, not it's, yeah. Great, thank you. And I suppose you need the spiral inductor here to minimize the stray cell and self-capacitance of, uh, of that. Yeah, so basically we're trying to win more inductance per unit length and not capacitance. And that's a very, that's a very important point. Any capacitance that doesn't participate in motion gets in your way. Because you, you have an LC resonance whose resonance frequency is being modulated by motion. But stray capacitance, capacitance say of the inductor, doesn't participate in motion and basically dilutes your, mm. your coupling mechanism. So we don't like that. And spiral is a good way to enhance that. And do you have a sense of what the participation of the straight capacitance is in this device? Uh, it's on the order of, it depends on the device. It can be on the order of a factor of two if it's, if it's bad and can be better than that. So okay. maybe half of your capacitance is stray and half of it is actually motion and you might be able to tweak in and do a better job uh, by designing it and and those are things that we are working on one way or another i see and you you don't want to make the drum bigger and get more capacitance there because maybe the mode gets too low and maybe the drum breaks too often so as it turns out we can't change the drum shape uh, as much as we would like. Like you can't make it too big because then it might have a chance to collapse, just stick because of uh, surface forces to the substrate. And if you make it too small, as you hinted, then the stray capacitance will overwhelm it, the motional capacitance, if you will. So we can play with it definitely by more than a factor of two in terms of mm -hmm. size and frequency, but not by an order of magnitude. We don't have an order of magnitude in terms of di and, you know, design parameters. Mm, gotcha. And uh, how well can you predict the frequency of the device ahead of time, let's say in modeling or simulation, um, or how much of that is, is up to the gods of fabrication? Um, depends on the accuracy that you care about. Like the devices that we fabricated, you know, we 
pretty much predicted the ballpark uh, at the, you know, better than 10%. But if you want to know it at the level of a percent, that, that's, that's hard. That's hard to simulate. Or I would say this, if one drum is, uh, has a diameter that's twice as big as the other drum, their frequencies are going to have a, a ratio of one to two. Mm -hmm. um, chip, chip to chip as well. Well, I guess yeah, on the same and, chip. Yeah, and chip to chip. But at the level of, I, I don't know, a percent, yes, there's there are mechanisms at hand. And I, I can, by the way, I have slides about those mechanisms because they, you know, they kept me up at night that <laughs> will, will cause that frequency to be different. And sometimes you do care at the 1% level. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully you're sleeping better these days, but let's let you proceed. We'll come back to, at the end with more questions. And folks, if we miss questions, feel free to post them, especially at the end in the comment chat box, and we'll get to them. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm happy to answer as as we go. It actually helps me uh, to punctuate my uh, my speech. All right, so Shlomo? so yeah, so yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try and continue about uh, entanglement. And for entanglement, the number one thing you need is two drums. So one drum doesn't cut it. You need Alice and Bob. And here it will be just two capacitors that are sharing a single LC resonance, very much like the two ions were sharing a single mode of motion. And, uh, you know, if I denote this by omega m1 and omega m2, and one of them painting in blue and the other in, in red is for a reason. Because if this is my LC resonance, I will shine two microwave pulses. One will be a red sideband with respect to the second drum, and one will be a blue sideband with respect to the first drum. What does that do? It does pretty much very similar analogous to the ions. The red sideband swaps energy between the microwave LC and the second mechanical mode. The blue sideband is a two-mode squeezing. It entangles the first mechanical mode with the microwave. Now, the way I drew it, it's not going to work. It's not going to entangle because the red sideband will cause the second drum to cool, and the and the and the blue sideband will cause that drum to uh, to have more and more and more energy. For entanglement to work, I'm going to put those two sidebands on top of each other. And now the microwave is going to mediate mechanical mechanical entanglement, making those two sidebands indistinguishable from my perspective. So that is the protocol. Um, it is a time domain protocol, not a not a frequency domain protocol. If you look at the y-axis, that shows you the frequency content, and the x-axis are the pulses. And you start by an active reset of both drums by cooling both close to the ground state, followed by a very strong and brief entanglement pulse. And then uh, you do a, uh, an independent characterization of those pulses. You do a readout measuring the position and momentum of both drums. So I'm, I'm trying to stress that it's a time domain protocol. Uh, now, how do I know could you just give us a quick, quick, more detail on the cooling of the two? How does the uh, active reset here work for for the two drums? Oh well, cooling is well is what basically John pioneered about a decade ago, which is uh, using sideband cooling of those drums. When you apply a red sideband, you're basically swapping energy between your mechanics and your LC resonance. But that LC resonance has a cold environment. It sees a cold 50 ohm in your fridge. And so it dissipates that energy into the cold environment, basically cooling and sucking energy from, from the mechanics in a one-way manner. So that's sideband cooling mediated by the LC resonator. Yeah, and, and the lifetime of that um, microwave mode was what order of magnitude again? So the the microwave mode had a uh, you know a, um, was as as wide as a megahertz ish if you wish. Right, rather, yeah, nanosecond, <laughs> nanoseconds, and uh, here both of them coupled to the same microwave mode, and they're both cooled through the same microwave. Well, mode. Well, if you if you squint, you'll see that you'll see that 
they're actually not seeing the same density of states. I'm, I'm basically using two different pieces of that uh, resonance uh, to cool them. Actually, I might have, um, maybe I should show that everything here is done uh, with uh, frequency uh, multiplexing. And so, and so these are, this is how sidebands look like. So they're not actually seeing the same density of states if I do a Fourier domain, Fourier transform of, of the data. Uh, that allows me to cool to cold environments that are uncorrelated, and you know it's a, it's a log scale on the y-axis. Hmm. Yeah. So you should imagine there is like a megahertz uh, resonance around this plus minus 400 kilohertz sidebands. I see. Yeah. Mm. And and this FC is the center of the of the microwave mode. Yeah, so the, the center is at 6.08 gigahertz, and these are sidebands around 6 gigahertz with a, an overall microwave line width of a megahertz. Sure, and you're saying, yeah, so they're uncorrelated and they're seeing slightly different environments because they're, they're probing its frequency different parts of the bath. Exactly. The, and the bath is wide enough for me to have that as a tool and that was part of our design parameters we we wanted that mm. uh, to be our tool i see yeah in essence the, the correlation time of the bath is so short that it doesn't really matter here exactly and when you want to entangle you make these two sidebands directly overlap so when you want to talk to them separately you space them apart a few hundred kilohertz so they you know they, they they're uncorrelated and only for the purpose of entanglement do you make sure that the two sidebands are indistinguishable one on top of the other. Hmm. And, and what, what you're seeing here in the, the video graph is that, that it is done on the fly. So basically it's done. So here, the two sidebands, you can't see it really, but they do not overlap. Here for entanglement, they perfectly overlap. And here for readout, again, they do not overlap. So for reset and readout, I don't want any correlations, only for the entanglement part. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. I think my squinting would have uh, would, would missed that. <laughs> uh, um, if you really, really zoom in, the, you know, the LaTeX will show it, but you know, it's, you know. That's all right, great, thank you. All right, so now on to verification. So we did all this, this pulse, but how do we know that the state is entangled? And for that, let me show you, uh, you know, a theory, an analytic solution of how entanglement looks like if this protocol works. So here you get to see position and momentum of a single drum and the two histograms that follow, a histogram of position and a histogram of momentum. And here's the other drum, uh, at two histograms and position and momentum. As you run this entanglement protocol, this is what you will see. You will see as if one drum becomes seemingly hot, it's being pumped by energy, and the other drum looks like it's being pumped by energy. In order to make sense of this, you have to look at cross correlations. So now I'd like to point out the same data, but the same not data, the same analytic solution, but now we're going to look at position, position, momentum, momentum, and the other two combination. And as I run this protocol, here's what you will see. What seems to be a hot drum on your left and a hot drum on your right is actually a highly correlated position, position, and a highly anti-correlated momentum, momentum. This is how it should look like in theory. But then how do you know that these are classical correlations or, or quantum mechanical correlations. And in 2000, Simon and Duan solved this problem. And here's what they said. They said, take your two-mode two, two mode system, and it's characterized by position and momentum of the first object and position and momentum of the second object. Now form the four by four correlation matrix. You have four random variables. It gives you 16 elements of a correlation matrix. By forming this correlation matrix, you can now uh, um, calculate the minimal symplectic eigenvalue of its partial transpose. I'm happy to say a lot of words about it, but it is 
essentially square roots and polynomials of entries in those matrix, giving you a single number, the minimal symplectic eigenvalue of the partial transpose. If it's bigger than a half, then you're looking at a classically correlated state. If it's less than a half, then that system is entangled. So you have to break the bound, and the bound is a half. But what does half mean here? Well, half means zero point motion. It means that the two drums agree, their variables agree better than their own zero point motion. Meaning that this drum and this drum agree with each other better than a, roughly the, the diameter of a proton is what it means. And similarly for momentum in the right units. And now what's the price to listen to what Simon says and the price is you have to measure all of the variables. You have to measure position and momentum, and you have to be able to do it with minimal noise. Otherwise, that will obscure this picture. Um, and now let's look at the experimental results. So let's start off with uh, individual drum variances. And so here's how the data looks like. And, and if I apply the protocol and have the two sidebands distinguishable, so they do not overlap, what you should expect to see is that one drum gets pumped with energy and the other drum loses energy. But our data doesn't look like that. When we ran the entanglement protocol, this drum starts to cool and then slowly warms up. This drum starts to warm up and slowly bends. Now, we, at this point, we have a good understanding of our simple protocol. We might as well plot the theory of the entanglement protocol. And when we plot the theory, it looks like it fits. So this is a step in the right direction. It doesn't prove entanglement. It shows, well, something is going on between those two drums. Next, you want to look at correlations. And now I'm going to show data that's similar to, to the video we just showed. So position and momentum of the left drum and position and momentum of the right drum. And as I play that movie, the experiment looks like, again, two seemingly hot drums. Again, referring to the correlations and specifically position, position, and momentum, momentum. If I run that experiment, I will see, at least to my, you know, to the naked eye, you see good position, position, correlation, and momentum, momentum, anti-correlation. That, however, doesn't mean it's entangled. It just means it's correlated. We have to listen to what Simon says. We have to apply the simon duan criteria. But before we do that, let's look at the covariance matrix. At the beginning of the protocol, my state is cold. So you can look at it as a cold fiducial state. And as you look at all the, uh, uh, the scatter, you see no pattern. It looks like small Gaussian of X1, P1 and a small Gaussian of X2 and P2. That can be encapsulated in single covariance matrix, which by the way, this is data. And as you can see, you just see a diagonal with a little bit of flickering of the white areas. It means there are no correlations. If you look at what we think is an entangled state, here's what you see. That's what you saw in the movie, position, position, correlation, and anti-correlation of momenta. And this is how the experimental uh, covariance matrix looks like. And the off, we see strong off diagonal terms that are about, about an order of magnitude bigger than what you saw in the cold fiducial state. One is positive and one is negative. I want to say that this is this when we saw this, we realized our shadows look good. They look entangled. This is uh, the covariance matrix after loss, after all the measurement efficiencies. And so we were able to dodge the bullet of entangling and not knowing about it. And I think that was an exciting moment for us in the lab because these are two uh, objects, diameter of, of a human hair, and their position and momentum agree, and they're entangled, and we get to see it with our own eyes on a computer. Uh, and so that was a, a, a exciting uh, for us. Um, now, how does the entanglement survive all this loss? And that I can refer you guys to the supplementary uh, of, of, of the paper, but a nice result that we saw is if the state is symmetric and undergoes symmetric loss, then the entanglement criteria after loss is the a convex combination of the entanglement criteria before loss plus a half. 
So if you start off by something that's less than a half, you're going to end up with something that's less than a half and vice versa. In our case, the state is not symmetric and the loss is not perfectly symmetric. You can see that from the diagonal. X1 and P1 are strong blue and X2 and P2 are light blue. So it's not perfectly symmetric. However, it does have a very distinct uh, structure. And given that structure, measuring um, the criteria to be less than a half after loss necessitates that it was entangled before loss and vice versa for these kinds of states. And so that's how we can see it uh, and, and, and with good uh, significance. And now let's look at the entanglement criteria after loss. So again, anything above a half is separable. It's classically correlated and everything below a half uh, is entangled. Here's the theory, which by now we know, and here's the data. And as you can see, as we crank up the entanglement pulse time, now it's longer and longer, the system becomes more and more entangled and violates the one half criteria. Now, it is still legitimate to ask, this is you know, in, in the presence of our 20% efficiency, since we're measuring position and momentum, the best efficiency we could have had is 50%. But it's still legitimate to ask, what was the original entangled state before all the loss mechanisms? What was it here? And, and we can do this uh, uh, calculation. And as we do that from the data, here's the theory and here's the data. Um, and now that we have had all this data, we actually threw it away. And what do I mean by that? Uh, the people who helped us understand both the uh, data and the experiment are the, the team at NIST that does quantum information theory, led by Manny Neal, Scott Clancy, and spearheaded by Izad, uh, Alex, and Sean. And from them, we learned that, that the way to measure something as fragile as entanglement is you have to work on your analysis before you have data. So you have to think about the problem before you ever saw data. Then you have to, you can take data, and this is what we just did, and fix your analysis protocol and think of all the edge cases and all the problems that might, might happen and train yourself. Now you throw the data and you cannot use it. You cannot publish anything with the data that was used for the training protocol. And then you take fresh data with a fixed protocol and analyze it. And what you do is GUI gate GU, which means you get what you get and you don't get upset. You run, you look at the data, you run the protocol that's fixed. If it's entangled, great. If, if not, you don't get to publish. And so with this uh, heavy heart, we, we went ahead and actually did this. Um, and here's the results after all the loss mechanisms. And as you can see, uh, uh, we, we, we were able to uh, violate uh, uh, the entanglement threshold and we measured 0.44. Now, some people might wonder about the statistic, statistical and systematic error bars. So let's start with the statistical error bars because that's easy. With microwave uh, control, it's fairly easy to collect a lot of data. And so we made sure, we wanted to, and we made sure that we have enough data to not be limited by statistical uncertainty. However, this measurement is not just a measurement that it has a very good resolution compared to the zero point motion. It has to have an accurate measurement. So it has, you have to know what a half is with very good accuracy. And knowing accuracy, turns out to be harder than knowing, uh, uh, than having resolution. And so after all of our calibrations, uh, our uncertainty in our calibrations uh, ended up having a systematic effect in our knowledge on what a half is. And if I don't know what a half is exactly, I don't know what is my entanglement measure exactly. And that's where the systematics come from. Now we can do the same thing before the beam splitter and here's the data. So it's a very deep blue, highly entangled state before loss. And at least as of, you know, at least in May, this was probably one of the most entangled macroscopic uh, objects to be observed. It's a 0.18 uh, 
minimal symplectic eigenvalue or almost 5 dB of squeezing, if you wish. Um, uh, yeah, so that was that result. And then you might ask, what's next? So, so we can do that. We can push a button and entangle these two mechanical oscillators using microwave. And, um, you know, I, I started this talk by uh, alluding to the 1995 ion entangling gate with, where they took two, ion, two ions or even a single ion and entangled with motion. If you look at 26 years later, how does the quantum information industry looks like or the experiments look like, this is how they look like. They're way more complicated. They're way more elaborate. There's a lot more structure going on because we've already graduated uh, the two ion experiment where you entangle or two transmon experiment where you entangle. And this complexity is rich and interesting and allows you to explore things that you really couldn't do with, with just two elements. And I think what's next for mechanics now that we have this building block is to be able to, to do complex protocols, to be able to do entanglement swapping or, or, or teleportation of mechanical modes or perform logic that's conditional on the measurement outcome um, with entangled, with entangled uh, mechanical devices. Now, I want to conclude my talk by uh, referring to our uh, beloved teacher of quantum mechanics, uh, Feynman. And in his uh, volume three, where he talks about quantum mechanics, there's an image of, of, of Feynman beating two drums. Uh, and I, I hope I was able to convince you guys that uh, we also could play a quantum mechanical sound on two, two mechanical drums. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of thinking or that kind of, of problems, uh, we, you know, I encourage you guys to reach out for the uh, now newly established quantum mechanical circuits lab at the Hebrew University. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I absolutely loved all of the visuals and analogies throughout. And I can say as much from the audience here, there's a bunch of really nice comments. Um, and uh, and I think you answered a few of the questions about measuring entanglement entropy for the two, two drums. Can you maybe go back to the slide where you had uh, the six plots of the beautiful data that correlates the position and momentum of the two drums? Uh, this one? Yes, um, it kind of looks like, at least visually, that like the top right panel looks elongated. Are those extra nonlinearities in in the drum coming in, or could you tell us more about that? Do you are you referring to this uh, to the right of that? Oh, this. Oh no, actually, what's happening is. Remember, one drum sees a red sideband and the other drum sees a blue sideband. Or if you wish, one drum has a bigger variance than the other. They're not, this is not a symmetric protocol. And the state, as I was saying, is not symmetric. When you plot, this is nothing more than plotting a, mm -hmm. a variable that's Gaussian and uncorrelated with another variable. This one is narrow and this one is wider. And, and that's because of the loss, right? Ideally, they should be the same in this units? Uh, uh, no, even in the ideal case, uh, because the protocol is not symmetric, they will not be the same. You get to see that, if you wish, here in those individual variances. As you can see, they follow each other. They, If you wish, they care about each other, but one has a bigger variance than the other, even in the ideal case. And the reason is one is experiencing a blue sideband and the other is experiencing a red sideband. At the limit of infinite entanglement, that will be negligible. So the state will become more and more and more symmetric as you apply. Uh, so you're kind of catching it midway. And you can ask, why didn't I go even further? And the answer is I was afraid of decoherence. I knew I had two, 300 microseconds of, of decoherence free runtime. And I said, let's go with an order of magnitude faster. Mm. And um, does I guess the decoherence isn't affected by the drives, such as due to heating or other nonlinear processes. Have you noticed any T1, T2 essentially degradation when you apply drives? 
Well, essentially it could. If your drives are strong enough, you will heat, you can end up heating your substrate. Uh, but I think a lot of the dance here was to avoid this, to use strong pumps, but not too strong because we didn't want any heating mechanism to kick in and have it short so that we don't worry about the inherent uh, thermal fluctuations of the device. Okay, so yeah, so that was something you had to actively uh, keep in mind as you were tuning. It's actually even worse. If you apply a strong enough tone, you could buckle the drum upwards and it will get stuck. Oh. <laughs> so if you drive it uh, and, you know, with with DB, if you don't know, DB is, a, it's you know, it's a very um, dangerous unit. If yeah. you don't know what you're doing, and, and it happened a few times, I, you know, I got those drums to buckle up. <laughs> yeah, 3 dB may not seem like a lot, but... <laughs> yeah, on resonance, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, uh, right. Uh, what about the geometry of these double drums? It seems to be different from the single drums. And I think uh, I think Joe Montado was here uh, earlier. Maybe Joe's still here. Uh, I think he called them uh, hot dog or uh, something to that effect. Oh, the hot dog and the bun. <laughs> well, well, the original design uh, was this. You know, you want to distinguish pizza between. Box. Yeah, the pizza. <laughs> you know, just make make one of them be a small drum, make the other be a big drum, and and that's it. And that's how you would distinguish them because they will have different frequencies. But the problem is, you know. Uh, is that they have a, you know, I, you know, we fab devices like this again and again and again, and they failed miserably, uh, a small drum and a big drum, and 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 the reason is uh, thermal contraction. And what I mean by that, when you make a drum at room temperature, the top plate is about 200 nanometers away from the bottom plate, but now you're going to cool it to 10 millikelvin, and the top plate is going to bend. Uh, towards the bottom plate, which is great, but you don't know by how much. It might it might be a few, you know, 10 nanometers, which one way or another, you don't know in advance. And it's, that's fairly hard to simulate. Now, what happens if you have two of those? They might not end up in the same place. Uh, uh, and then you're sensitive to this phenomena, to the final uh, plate separation of the drums, like the fourth power. And so, however we tried, two different drums uh, didn't end up fairly similar in, in, in their plate separation. And so, the idea was, let's make the drums identical, and then they will end up in the same, you know, same initial condition, same outer shape, they'll end up in the same plate separation. Um, but if they're identical, I cannot distinguish them. The whole experiment is based on frequency multiplexing and knowing that one drum is a very different frequency from the other drum. And so we came up with this uh, hot dog and hamburger design where the top plate is identical. It's identical, so it will end up in the same plate separation, but I'm not coupling to it identically. As you can see, the bottom electrode here couples very well to the uh, a uh, uh, hot dog mode of motion, it couples very poorly to the hamburger mode. And the bottom plate here couples very strongly to the hamburger mode. And for that reason, I can spectrally tell you, I'm driving this drum, I'm driving that drum. And that solved it, like the first chip that looked like that solved the problem. So you can think about it, it took a good fraction of a year and five minutes to solve this problem. <laughs> That's that is amazing. Uh, by the way, a comment from somebody: the device looks rather beautiful, so clean. Um, you can see artistic and impressive. Uh, it's, uh, it really is. And were you able to simulate uh, the on-off coupling ratio? I mean, you certainly still have some coupling on each device to both modes, uh, but I'm guessing that ratio is more than a thousand or something like that. Do you mean the coupling between this drum and that drum when the pumps are off? Um, more like between the X and Y. You mean between this mode and that mode? Uh, point that again, please. 
So there's when you when you say uh, coupling, there's you can imagine that when there's no energy in the system, maybe some phonons radiate through the skirt and interact with the other drum. That's one possibility, right? And the other is within the drum, you have a few modes, and the question is, do they talk to each other, or do I get to see them? That's right, within the same drum. So within the same drum, uh, those are very good eigenmodes. You know, the quality factor is is a million, and they they can be you know half a megahertz apart. So so I don't need to worry about um, you know uh, a spectator mode, if you wish, where I'm trying to talk with one harmonic mode and the other mode gets in the way. Uh, um, I mean, or I would say the experiment was designed so that I won't have to worry about it. As for the, um, yeah, as for my ability to see or not see, well, as you can see, this plate really mimics the shape of the hamburger. And it's almost cancels, it almost does not see the hot dog mode. It almost perfectly cancels it and doesn't couple to it. And we you know, and we measured and quantified it. And you know, you would need orders of magnitude more pumps to be able to see the weakly coupled mode here. And so, so we were protected from that as well. Wonderful. And Madhavan, uh, I may have missed where which question or comment is, so you might have to repost it. But uh, I think it was maybe clarified because I'm not sure how to ask your question about the NIST electromechanics. So feel free to update that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, could you tell us, meanwhile, uh, Shlomi, more about the calibration of the absolute calibration? Uh, how, how was that performed again? Well, actually, there. those thermal yeah. plots that I was showing uh, sort of the key. Well, we're, we're using the equipartition theorem, if you wish. So, so here, I know or that the drum at the end of the day, after waiting long enough, will equilibrate to its environment. And I know the temperature of the environment, and I know the frequency. So this number has to be K Boltzmann T over H bar omega. And now I know T and I know omega, so I can quantify this and get this in quanta units. But if I want to be more careful, what I should do is I should scan the mixing chamber temperature and measure variance and make sure that I'm following a linear line, meaning I'm sort of verifying the equipartition. I'm verifying that this goes along KT over H bar omega. And notice they have different omegas, so they have different inclinations. You can also see a slight deviation uh, around 20 millikelvin and below from the equipartition theorem, which means at these temperatures, the drum does not necessarily equilibrate from the to to the mixing chamber so you cannot use those for your calibration you have to use the points where equipartition works how how do you know that it's actually calibrated to the mixing chamber temperature i mean there could be you know other heat sources all the wires and so forth dc currents so it could potentially be at a higher temperature than the mixing chamber um, wouldn't that also be a consideration it could. Um, you're saying, what if there's an offset? What if, yes, it's it follows a line, but that line is offset because it it's always hotter. But then whatever that mechanism is, it's a, it has to be a mechanism that also changes linearly as you change the mixing chamber by a factor of 10. And a lot of these mechanisms don't have a linear temperature dependence. They might have a T to the second power and T to the third power, uh, and, and, and then you, you should be able to see it. However, if there's a deviant mechanism that behaves like a mixing chamber temperature and makes everything a little bit hotter, yes, I would be blind to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think this line is probably quite convincing. Other so that's really nice because my, my other question would have been well, when you say mixing chamber temperature is that like a ruox or a nuclear thermometer measurement because uh, you know the thermometers below 50 millikelvin can be 
not particularly um, good, but but I mean, this also looks very well. Linear. This is, <laughs> you know, like thanks to Joe, uh, we actually have two Ruox thermometers placed at different places. And all of these readouts, we made sure that two different Ruoxes agree. You know, I think they're placed a, f a fairly good distance on the on the mixing chamber plate, and they uh, agreed better than a millikelvin, so a fraction of a millikelvin agreement. And when they disagreed, we didn't use the data. Okay, that's very nice. Still, you could argue maybe there's a mechanism that you know. You know, Zlatko, this is a very good point. When you're trying to measure not a phenomena like A changes by a factor of two, but, you know, the absolute value of A, you worry about everything. And we worried exactly about those things. But you can, you know, you can minimize your uncertainty to a point and report it. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think these things still worry me. I don't think uh, it's the end of that, you know, end of that kind of uh, research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, there's there's always some some you know, like Bell tests, right? There's always another potential loophole, but at some point you're convinced enough. <laughs> um, sorry, go on. No, I I think that's that's a good point. You you scrutinize the results. That's that's basically what the theory team. Uh, taught us. You scrutinize the results, you try to come up with any mechanism that will fool you or get in your way and cause systematics, you characterize it until you're basically, you can't think of anything else. Then you freeze everything, you're not allowed to do any more analysis, you take a fresh set of data, analyze it, and that's it. Wonderful. And I think that's another way to, you know, separate the um, the the person that's calibrating and the person that's trying to entangle it may mm -hmm. may be the same person but they they're not allowed to uh, interact in space time if you wish o only one way if you wish well Shlomi I'm noticing that we're twenty minutes over so I think this is a great uh, point to. Uh, thank you. And by the way, let you have any final words before we thank everyone as well. I, you know, I maybe I don't know if this is this might be a good opportunity to to actually thank the Kiskit team. Um, you know, I'm I'm seeing uh, grad students that are doing their first step in learning quantum information, and they're already starting to speak Kiskit, if you wish. <laughs> and I see researchers that are doing. Um, uh, research about non-equilibrium quantum thermodynamics, and they run ideas on IBM uh, uh, processors using Qiskit, and I, I think that's uh, that's just a great contribution to to the academic community, and, and you know, uh, I appreciate that. Well, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much, and very glad to hear that is having a good impact on the community. I think that's really the aim. Shlomi, thank you very much for the very clear and wonderful talk and congratulations again on the very nice results to you and the team. And thank you everyone for tuning in. This talk will stay recorded so you can go back and rewatch it. Uh, we thank you again for all the questions. And with that, we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time.